Hey gang, it's Mike from Increditainment here with something special that I want to share with you today. As you know, in about three weeks, I will be down at the Megacon convention in Orlando, Florida. While I'm in Orlando, I'm going to be covering the MMC30 event. What's MMC30, you might ask? It is a 30th anniversary, once-in-a-lifetime opportunity reunion for the Mickey Mouse Club. Some great talent is going to be there. Rona Bennett, Fred Newman, Mark Warden, Tony Luca, Lindsay Alley, all of it. Hosted by the great Joey Fatone. There's going to be about 20, 25 Mouseketeers in attendance, and it's going to be a great, great experience that you don't want to miss. Increditainment will be there, making sure we have all the photos and videos and even some interviews with fans and some of the tiers. You're not going to want to miss it. But what I want to share with you today is something that I did about two years ago. I was doing a podcast that never got to see the light of day, and I had the opportunity to interview one of the Mouseketeers, one of the guys bringing this great event to you. His name's Chasen Hampton. He was a member of the party. He was a member of the Mickey Mouse Club. And what he's going to do in this great interview, share a little bit about what it was like working on the Mickey Mouse Club, what it was like working at the Disney MGM Studios at the time. What is it like having a job, being on television, being a kid in a theme park? An amazing story. He's going to share that with you. And he's going to tell you a little bit about some of the work he's been doing since he left the Mickey Mouse Club. So what I want you to do is sit back, relax, and listen to this great interview with one of the great members of the Mickey Mouse Club. And hey, if you're down at Megacon, we're going to see you real soon. Catch you later. Um, I'm sitting here with Chase Hampton, who um, everybody knows best from the Mickey Mouse Club and the party. Um, if you're a fan back in the 90s, you know, he was on the show with a bunch of great people. Uh, some small people you might know, like uh, Britney Spears, Christine Aguilera, but certainly the party was the um, original breakout hit from the Mickey Mouse Club. And um, since then, he's been on shows like Buffy the Vampire Slayer and The X-Files. So we're going to talk a little bit with him now about uh, his career and how he got started as, as a young person in the creative arts. So uh, welcome, Chase. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me, man. This is awesome. Yeah, we're here at um, uh, the so uh, South Coast Comic-Con up in Boston. Uh, it's a great experience. Um, the first question I want to ask you is, how old were you when you began um, in show business, and how did you get into it? Uh, it's interesting. Um, I, I actually fell into it very young. Probably, I mean, I was singing three years old. I was in a, like a music preschool um, that my parents put me in, which I'm, I'm blessed that they did. Um, it just kind of got, got me kind of started. I was super shy, and I got into a little acting class um, probably around eight years old, and I started competing. I was, I'm from Oklahoma, Oklahoma City, and not a lot going on there at that time especially. And, um, but they did have a thing called Oklahoma Kids, which was like a nonprofit uh, competition that they would have five levels, and you could kind of move on up. And the first time I did it, I made it to level five, and I was like, "Oh, I'm pretty good at this." I, you know, and people are screaming, so you kind of, kind of got attracted to the uh, attention real quick, and um, started taking lessons and acting class, and um, kind of fell in love with it, and would do these competitions. And it's funny because those competitions still go on, the Oklahoma Kids. I think uh, I was watching The Voice not too long ago, and Blake Shelton uh, sh did a shout out to the guy who runs that because he was in it too. <laughs> I was like, oh my god, I did I had no idea Blake Shelton was <laughs> and in you knew Oklahoma the guy Kids. He gave the shout out. Yeah, to? yeah, Dr. Dale was uh, the guy who uh, who runs that, and uh, it's a great service for kids. It was great for me and kept me uh, out of trouble and kept me singing and dancing and and got me basically ready for the big audition that came out of nowhere for the Mickey Mouse Club because that that wasn't uh, I wasn't training for that or planning for that. It just happened to be in the right place, right time, and had all the skills necessary, you know, to be to make it happen. All right. So talking about the Mickey Mouse Club, what was that process like? How did you find out about it? Um, and how many kids auditioned? Oh, wow. uh, I think on IMDb it says something like sixty to eighty thousand. Some people, uh, maybe even more, honestly, but. Um, my dad actually got a call at work uh, randomly from somebody we have no idea. It was kind of an anonymous call saying, your son has to go to this audition in Dallas. So he called my mom, and they pulled me out of school, and we went straight down there and got in line. And there was like about a 1,000 people in uh, wow. the gallery in Dallas. Oh, wow. So it was in the mall. In the mall, oh, yep. Wow. And everybody's out there, you know, like you see in the movies, like practicing in the halls and like it's just chaos. And uh, I went in, and I never came out. Um, my mom's waiting at the back door going, where the hell is my son? <laughs> you know, so 
she finally poked her head in and was like, I'm just checking on my son. And um, the casting director had pulled me around from the audition mm-hmm. and said, come sit next to me. We're going to audition the rest of the people, and you're going to sit next to me. Oh, wow. So I was like, okay. And uh, he's like, he, he's, Chase is fine, Mom, don't worry. And she's like, okay, I'm just checking. And then before I knew it, they had me outside interviewing with like Mary Hart for Entertainment Tonight. And I was mm. just... It was a whirlwind, and um, the thing was, though, it wasn't for the Mickey Mouse Club. Mm-hmm. It was for a show called uh, Why Because We Like You, which was going to be a movie about the original Mouseketeers. Okay. And I was going up for the role of Lonnie and Bobby, but I ended up getting Lonnie at, the, at that point, mm-hmm. um, and did the callbacks in L.A. And, and the whole bit. And that's where I met Tiffany and Jennifer, because they were in the movie, for the movie, up for the movie as well. Okay. That was in 89. In 89, most people don't remember, but there was a huge writer strike that happened. Okay. And all the TV shows went off. They all started running reruns, and everybody stroke, striked. And um, so at that point, MGM Studios was starting up in Florida. Mm-hmm. And they said, we need a full-time set there. We have studios there. We, need a, we, we want to do this Mickey Mouse Club thing and have a show that the tour can go by and see and be more of a permanent place for you know the tour for, for it to look legit as a movie studio mm-hmm. basically and so i think we were more there put as a kind of a, a presentation for the you the became tour. an attraction at yeah, the park basically because they wanted us to work they would always say okay you have to work during thanksgiving and christmas and all the best hours because those are the hours that people come to the parks for gotcha. vacations you know so it was odd hours um and we did a show a day which was crazy but um we got hired for that and um, as as you know the show took off uh i don't i think unbeknownst to them i, I don't think they planned it um the subscriptions went off the roof mm-hmm. and it just so it, it, it gave the success of the show in that sense they could measure it by the subscriptions because yeah. at that time a lot of people couldn't afford the Disney Channel but the people who did everyone was at their house watching the Mickey Mouse Club so. but yeah an amazing way to grow up and that was a, probably got that show at 11 12 years old signed at 11 but started at more like 12 oh wow so now let me ask you this question so you said um, you guys did a show a day um, and it I mean, there are various ages. You said you were about 11, 12 years old. Um, who was the youngest cast member, and then who was the oldest cast member? And then what was like your day like at filming the show? Because you know you did the little comedy bits, they did the musical bits, um, a lot of little interstitials in between there. Um, you didn't shoot those all in one day, or how do, how were those broken up? Nuts. That's funny you say that because most people have no idea how draining that is. So most shows shoot a show a week. You know, like in California, the big shows you watch, the sitcoms will shoot. They'll get their script on Monday, do a script read, you know, do fittings and, and talk about what's going to happen during the show, rehearse all week, and then do their live show like Thursday <laughs> or Friday. We, in the first three or four seasons, we were doing a show a day. So that's like a soap opera. But then add in musical numbers and the fact that those musical numbers needed to be choreographed and recorded. Mm-hmm. So a day might consist of, if I don't confuse you too much, going to work, pulling into a trailer and going to school first, because you needed, everyone had to have three hours of school total. But you usually didn't do it all consecutively. It had to kind of be split up during the day, 15 minutes here, 30 minutes here, an oh, hour wow. here. And now did you all go to school at the same time? or? Yes, for the most part, but people were being pulled out at all times. Okay. Because they were being pulled out to do a voiceover intro, record or maybe um, if there was an off-set shoot, like uh, some B-roll footage they needed to film for something they needed to edit for later. Um, but usually the stuff you were, reco- you were recording or rehearsing for today is going to be the show you shoot tomorrow. Oh, wow. So you still have the show today that's going to happen. They're going to bring the live audience in, and you have to remember all the stuff you rehearsed yesterday. While learning the new things. And the dance numbers and the vocals and... So there wasn't like pitch corrector, and there wasn't like things that could kind of save you. It was all just real as you saw it. So wow. sometimes they're rough, but that's how, that's the way it was because we were doing a show a day, and some of those skits were 20, 25 pages long. You know? mm-hmm. And for a kid, it's a lot to memorize. So like what hour? So combined with the um, filming of the show, school rehearsal, like what were, what was the schedule like? Yeah. Getting like eight to three or. About eight to probably like eight to four, um, but it would go on. It would go on later than that a lot of times. And then what ended up happening is because there's different laws from California to Florida, mm-hmm. 
So at, at one point, SAG laws started being established in Florida, and so strict hours started being applied. And then they moved the schedule to uh, a show a week, mm-hmm. but you'd run the show twice live. So we would rehearse, rehearse, rehearse as a live show, and then we'd run that show twice, and we'd film it full out. So if there were any mistakes, they'd steal from the other one. Gotcha. Yeah. You know. But it was a lot of stress. Even doing a show a week was still still tough to do. It was that that much material. Yeah. Now they, you said that you were there. Like Disney had you there during like pretty much their busy season. So that, I I, mean, I remember as a as a kid, I went to Disney World and we missed it by a day or two. But uh, it was like the end of August, so they they were filming it, and I missed it. But then you said like during the holidays, like Christmas time and all that. So what was that like for you and and your family? So you. Um, you said you're not from Florida, so did they bring you all there? How long were you there? What was it like leaving school with your regular friends and then going back and forth like that? I mean, it's tough for anybody to leave a school at that age. You know, we were still kids. We were still acting as kids. We were still acting out as kids. We were still, you know, just moody teenagers at some times, and uh, it was tough. So a lot of the, you know, this is something I was already wanting to do as a kid, so well, it was a dream come true, you know. Uh, coming out of Oklahoma, my parents were stoked to move to Florida and like, hey, no snow, no ice, awesome. And uh, they went ahead and stayed there. But a lot of families split where the mom or mom would go and dad would stay home mm-hmm. with the job in the house, wherever the state they were from. And as the show continued to move on and move on and kept bringing us back, a lot of people just relocated to Florida. Because it, be, it became easier then in that regards. But yeah, I mean, it's hard to leave your friends. Uh, I wasn't the most popular kid in school at, at that, you know, in Oklahoma. I was kind of a shy kid, but I would be my, all my friends and my respect and popularity came out of school, like in my acting school. Mm-hmm. So when I'd walk in my acting school, I'd be like, "Hey, Chase!" You know, everybody knew who I was. But at school, school, I was just kind of quiet to myself. But of course, after I got Mickey Mouse Club, everybody's like, "Yeah, everybody's your best everybody, friend." Everybody's, everybody's your best friend. Yeah. <laughs> and I did go back and strut the halls a couple times just for fun. <laughs> Now, let me ask you, so obviously Mickey Mouse Club was successful, so now what happened with the party? What was the evolution? How did they choose the five of you to become the party? And then what was that like with the other cast members? Um, Because obviously you guys kind of went off on your own offshoot there, like... I mean, I remember probably season three, like, you know, they'd do the whole roll call, you know, and it'd be like, the party, and you guys weren't even individual anymore. What was that like? And the reason the why they did, they included us as the party on the show is because we were still under contract with Disney. Mm-hmm. So, two separate contracts. Once they, they moved us over to Hollywood Records, um, that was basically on loan, even though they're the same company and mm-hmm. Disney, but Lake Buena Vista was two separate contracts. So... so the Mickey Mouse Club was loaning us out to do the party, and in our minds, we were all off the show, but yeah, we were still under contract, so they would continue to, to piece us in, maybe answer, you know, fan mail at mm-hmm. some point, or there might be like, we're going to check in with the party on the road, you know. Um, a lot of times, the commercials were, in fact, part of the show, but no one really, because it's a subscription channel, so mm-hmm. they don't really necessarily depend on their sponsors or whatever, so they could put up anything whenever on their channel. Uh, I wish it was a different time now. I wish they had ABC back then because mm-hmm. they could have syndicated it and got it out to much more people that I think would have enjoyed it. Mm-hmm. I mean, it was definitely it was definitely a smart way of cross promoting that. Even though, like you said, Disney owned sure. both it was brands. The first social media, there was no social yeah. media back then, so it's like all of a sudden there'd be a commercial saying, "The party's in Pueblo, Colorado. Make sure you go." Yeah. And, and I'm sure the sure sales went up too. We'd show up, and there'd be thousands of people there. You know, and that wouldn't happen for a lot of bands because. They'd have to, you know, build a fan base or mm-hmm. only be popular in a local place. Mm-hmm. So. And then, and then um, the last season, you and Tiffany did come back, and you kind, you kind of uh, took that host host role yep. over. What was that like coming back? And now you had this whole brand new generation of kids like Christina and Justin and all of them. It was it was awesome. I mean, uh, we 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 definitely wanted to come back. A lot of people were like, "Why are you coming back? Is that like a step down or is that a step?" We were like, "No way." You know, it's like for once, it's keeping you employed, it's keeping you out there. Um, it's keeping you connected to your fan base because they all came from the Mickey Mouse Club, a lot of them. And we definitely did have separate party fans, but mm-hmm. but our core and where we grew up was uh, Mickey Mouse Club. So to come back as a kind of an adult role, an adult figure, and kind of mm-hmm. you know meet Christina and Justin, and I mean Christina could you know sit on my lap practically. She was so tiny. Uh, they were they were young, and they were only there for a blip. I think yeah, maybe a two season seasons, or two. Yeah. So when you talk to them, it's it's not as a big of a deal to them, mm-hmm. but. 
it's, it was a launching place for them, but at the same time, spending seven seasons there, or you know, spending all those seasons for us with the people who were on from the beginning. You know, we basically grew up on the show. Absolutely, we grew up in the back lot of MGM. Do you have a Do you have a favorite memory, whether it be from the show or even something that, that happened on the being like you said, grew up in MGM Studios? I'm sure, like you saw all these all things. The time. I mean, I see, <laughs> I go home and see pictures and I remember things. But I mean, Damon and Albert and I used to roam the park a lot when we weren't supposed to. You know, we'd be like, hey, we're, I'm going for a bagel. You know, I'm going to the restroom and it's going to school. And they'd be like, okay, come right back. And all of a sudden, we'd be on a great movie ride or something. You had special access to the rides, I assume? Well, we could walk. We could just walk in the park because we had, we were from coming from backstage mm-hmm. and we had our passes. Um, but we did find secret doors and, you know, <laughs> ways up onto the roof. Or there was a secret door that we found that got us into the great movie ride from the back. And we could open up and be posing with the gangsters. Like when you come across <laughs> like all the b- gangsters in a gunfight, we'd be like <laughs> just <That's> posing. <laughs> but and we never got in trouble for that. Thank God. But. Oh, you're the kids on the uh, kids on the set, and I'm sure everybody knew you guys were there and oh, yeah. having a good time. I'm sure, I'm sure, a bunch of people didn't like us. But <laughs> I'm sure, they were annoyed. But <laughs> um, so now. What would you advise, like young people who are interested in, in now in 2017, if they wanted to get into the entertainment business, whether it be singing, acting, dancing, what have you? What, what would you say the best thing for them to do? Because I mean, with social media and stuff is blown up. It's a lot different social than it was media then. Social makes it easier and harder because now everybody is a professional and everybody does. If you can just call yourself anything on the internet and people believe it, so um, it's much harder to kind of prove yourself, but. You know, for parents putting their kids in, I mean, it's, it's, I would never say no. I would say it's, it's one of the hardest industries in the world and it's super tough on a person's ego and, um, you know, they have to be willing to kind of take it. <laughs> it's, it's, you're going to hear no a hundred times more than a yes. And, um, but I think cognitively and, and things that it does for children outside of the industry alone, you know, whether it's social speaking or just, you know, learning how to deal with people and talk to people and, it's, it's done a lot for me. And music's you know, saved my life multiple times. So just just by having a skill like that you can fall back on. Or, you know, if you get lost, just sit down and play the guitar and sing and make yourself feel better. I mean, just for the simplest of reasons. Um, but I'm all for putting, you know, for people joining it. But I, I would say for anyone who really loves the industry, ask yourself the question that I would say ask your husband or wife before you marry them or, you know, before you get married. And that's like, can I live without this person? Mm-hmm. You know? So if you can live, if you can't live without being a performer, I'd say go for it. Mm-hmm. So it's a lot of time on the road. It's a lot of time away from your family, a lot of sacrifice. You know, you mentioned a little of that with us moving and, and moving away from our families and grandparents and grandpas. Mm-hmm. And now, do you, have, do you have any siblings? No. Oh, okay, because that was going to be the next question. I'm sure some of the other uh, cast members had that. Like, oh, yeah. Because all of a sudden here, our family, like you said, we're relocating because my brother and my sister is now yeah. on the show. So, I mean, that even, you said that's a sacrifice not only for the parents, yeah. but for Another their sibling, siblings, yeah. too, as well. Like, I don't get the glory, but I got you're going to move me away from all my friends? That's not fair, right? Yeah. yeah. Everybody seemed really cool, and, and they all became, all the brothers and sisters came part of the family, and, you know, we had big parties together, and we went to Orlando, yeah. and... It was a really special time for a lot of the crew and a lot of the directors. Mm-hmm. It was their first projects too. So, like the, the director, our director for Mickey Mouse Club is now the director of uh, the Talk. Okay. In LA. Okay. Uh, that was the TV show with, with Raven on it. And yeah, uh, Sharon Osbourne, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Um, and a lot of them have just gone on to do amazing things. Like the, the producer bought the rights to Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and, he's, and he turned it into a movie and all of a sudden oh, wow. he's like bye bye <laughs> and I remember him pulling us in the office one day and saying what do you guys think of these turtles and we were like what, what is that like, that's crazy I, we don't get it and he's like okay you don't get it and it's funny because I, I, even as a kid I didn't get it now I do <laughs> well certainly I come into a thing like this you see like yeah. pe- people love all this stuff yeah and it still lives and, and those guys were right there in the heat of it the guy who used to make our props mm-hmm. uh, directed and wrote Blair Witch Project. Oh wow! Bye bye. He took off. You know what I mean? So just, and who knew that? Who, who knew that that was going to become what it became? Yeah. Any of these guys, it, you just the most random people just took off 
and, and sword, you know, with the inspiration they got through Mickey Mouse Club and the kind of the, the grooming, mm-hmm. you know, that you got. Absolutely. So they, they took care of us, kind of as a family, so it's very nice. Because we were kids, so they still, even if I see them today, they still look at us as kids. Yeah. I mean, and like you said, the families were all involved, so I mean, it, it must have been like a very warm and welcoming setting, and especially like as time went on and different cast members left, new cast members came in, I'm sure it was very welcoming for, for everybody that came into there. I'm sure that's what makes it hard for Disney doing the show, if they were to do the show again in that sense is that you can't just you don't just hire the kids you end up hiring teachers mm-hmm. you're in charge of their education you're in charge of the families you're in charge of mom and dad stage parents if there are mm-hmm. you know, so it's a lot that comes with it absolutely um, so now uh, tell us a little bit about what you're doing now I mean you've been on Buffy you've been on X-Files what else have you been doing and what can we look forward to in the future uh, I made the rounds in Hollywood and kind of did every 90s show you can get on Seventh Heaven and Sabrina and all those fun um, I still do acting I've never stopped doing music I still do solo music I still play I uh, still write for people still do features for people mm-hmm. um, I've gotten really hardcore into teaching and helping kind of giving back to kids uh, I ran a school out in Agora Hills for five, six years uh, teaching and had amazing celebrity clients um, oh, wow. And some of the best times of my life, just kind of being able to give back, because we had so many people that helped make our careers and, mm-hmm. and open open arms for us. So, um, and I know how important that was in our success. So, mm-hmm. I'd like to kind of find people and help them, and maybe give them uh, the support they need, or you know, just the, the nudge or the push. I, I, as, an, as an educator myself, and as doing these uh, programs for young people at um, these different kinds of events, like definitely, I think kids need that extra push and someone to believe in them. And some kids don't know that they're good because the parents aren't in the industry, so they don't, they're mm-hmm. like, no, that'll never happen. But, you know, it could happen. You just show them that, that they have the potential yeah. to do it. And to let the parents know, well, just so you know, I've done this, and I did it as a kid, and I can tell you your kid's talented, or your kid could do this if they wanted to do it. Just so they have that option, just so the kid doesn't grow up and say, man, I wish I had that chance. At least I kind of... Yeah, shoehorn the idea in there yeah. for a second. Put it, it out there, you know, you never because you never know, you never know unless you're going to try. That's right. Um, and then um, there's a lot of stuff going online. There's a big online community about Mickey Mouse Club about the party. Um, what can you tell us about maybe uh, some upcoming party events if there's anything? Well, we did uh, reunite for a bit uh, and do, we made some new music. And uh, the hardest part about that is that we're all in different states, so it makes it really difficult to get together and rehearse or to plan things. Uh, Dee Dee's doing amazingly well in Steven Universe, so that's keeping her extremely busy. And she's been doing some Broadway stuff as well. Damon's in Houston. D- Mr. DJ just mm-hmm. did a, a gig for 50 Cent. I mean, the guy's, oh, wow. He's like DJ of Houston. Or of Texas. <laughs> he's probably booked out for years. Um, he does very well. Um, we, you know, we're, we're, we're going to say never, say never. You know, mm-hmm. We're always open to, to jumping in and doing some stuff. And there's unreleased music that hasn't been put out. So, oh, wow. I mean, me and Damon were talking about it yesterday. We were, we were Skyping them in with some fans here. And, oh, nice. And, um, Very nice. So we were talking about, hey, maybe we should release another one. Why not? Yeah, might as well. I mean, yeah. certainly. I mean, people don't make money, just so anybody who's listening, people don't really make money on music itself anymore. It's more of a business card at this point mm-hmm. because of the way it's distributed <laughs> through screen, um, you know, streaming and all that stuff. Um Obviously, if you got a license to a movie or something, there's some mm-hmm. there's some profit there. But so, you know, we it's, it's fun for us to share that music and get it out there for the fans because it's pretty much just for that. We're not trying to make a buck. We're not trying to do anything other than just kind of keep people loving it. You know, yeah. keep 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 the memory alive and you sure. know, like do the stuff that you like to do. And it's, and it's definitely tough with social media now. I mean, if you don't if you don't put anything out in six weeks, you're you're basically dark. You yeah, go you dark, go. and people kind of start to forget about you. So. You know, even being here, you know, today and yesterday is, kind of helps bring the awareness back and the brand awareness. Of like, oh, yeah, I remember that. Oh, I remember that song. Like, yeah. I hear that all the time. You're like, you sing that song? <laughs> yeah. 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 You guys, look, there were four albums you guys put out, right? Yeah, over 40 songs. Yeah. yeah. And so. people are like, why aren't they on iTunes? You know, and the answer to that is we don't own that music. You know, yeah. We were signed by Hollywood Records. Most people just don't know how that works. But, mm-hmm. So if anybody wants to hear it or is, is yearning to hear the party on iTunes, make sure you tag Hollywood Records. Or, Disney. Or Disney. And make sure that you, know, you tag them properly so they can actually see it because they will see it. Mm-hmm. And uh, then, you know, if enough people do it, you never know. Absolutely. Cool. Um, and then for anybody that wants to follow you online, do you have a website? or? Um, I'm chasinglife.com or chasinghampton.com. 
um, for stuff, and also, you know, Twitter, Chasen under slash um, Hampton, and I think I'm on Facebook as Chasen. So, yeah. Excellent. Cool. So you are out there. And oh, for sure. I'm very, very up, up on the <laughs> And And then, of media. course, like, there's all the, uh, mouth, the MC um, Facebook pages and groups and yeah. Instagram. So certainly people can find you and what's going on with upcoming events Absolutely. through that as well. Please then. do. All right. Awesome. Thank you for your time, Chase. Thank you. Appreciate, appreciate it. it. Appreciate Thank it. you.